Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. Wine has become a major product in New York and around the world. So since I am not a wine uh, connoisseur, uh, I have brought together, or should I say my executive producer has brought together some of his friends and buddies to talk about the wine business and what's happening in the wine business around New York and around the country. My guests today include, and I'm very happy, the owner, the proprietor, of Angel Share Wine and Red Hook Winery, Mark Snyder, the proprietor, the real proprietor, even though he's your partner, and the managing partner at Crush Wine and uh, Spirits, uh, Robert Chagrin, Bernie's son, who in charge of all the uh, the beverages, the wines at uh, Jean George Management, and last but not least, the executive producer of my show, the man who's been on here nearly as much as Bruce Mosler. I'll be taking over the show uh, okay. any day now. Okay. <laughs> Switch seats. Drew and the Porrent, okay. Uh, Drew and Mike show. Okay, the Drew and Mike show <laughs> of the Myriad. So what happened? I mean, you, you, since you were older than everyone in this room. That's right. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, the including oldest. me. Okay. Uh, when, did, when did wine, when you started, you know, your first restaurant, was wine that big? Uh, the answer is yes. And actually, my whole career, I think, is somewhat in parallel to a surge in popularity, um, um, and certainly in but, but uh, acceptance was, of was, of was wine, wine that big when you and he grew up in uh, uh, Stuyv in Well, uh, the, the answer Boone's is Boone's farm was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the answer is that wine is, uh, you know, something that culturally has been around the world, and it took a little bit of time in America uh, for wine, I think, to graduate. And for me, uh, it was an extraordinary trip to the wine country, Napa Valley. Silverado Trail, and I came back, and the name of the, my first restaurant was going to be the Silverado Trail. And then just one day, I'm working at La Grenouille as a captain, nice. and I'm pouring this beautiful white wine. It's glowing in my hand, and it's called Montrachet. And it was expensive, and it's one of the great wines of the world. And I said, you know what? Silverado Trail is going to have to wait. I'm opening <laughs> a restaurant called Montrachet. And what, uh, here's the great story, uh, Michael. Montrachet opens with 60 wines. But believe it or not, in 1985, to have a list with any wines that had American wines in parity with the great French wines was rare. And the name of the restaurant was named after one of the great wines of the world. So we immediately were sending a message to our customer that we were going to be a quality restaurant because of the name Montrachet. And the wine list went right. from 60 wines to 1,000 plus wines and a grand award overnight. So how many wines do you, do you have in your restaurants? I mean, the John George restaurants, which are fantastic restaurants. You know, 
the par, I know you worked for him at one time, you know. Yes, uh, I did. It was great. It was a great time. Okay, had a great time working for him. How many wines do you sell at your restaurants? Oh, it depends on the restaurant, the size of the restaurant. For the smaller restaurant like Perry Street, we'll have like 100, 120 wines. But for the bigger restaurant like uh, at Jean Georges, we'll have somewhere around eight, 900 selections. Yeah. But on a Any nightly basis, uh, if you're, let's just say you're doing 100 meals, it'll be about one bottle for every two, three, or four guests. So that's 25 bottles of wine, minimally, a night. And quite frankly, we have to go back to Windows on the World mm. and the great Kevin Zraeli and the Cellar in the Sky, right. where again, they introduce American wine. And American, the surge of American wine in this country is what popularized wine, I believe, in general. Right, but you know, Mark brought some wine today, especially the two that you make. These, yep. are, these are made in Brooklyn. Correct. I mean, and they're available at Crush. Yep. Uh, wine and Spirits on 57th Street, beautiful store, even though you're his partner. And by the way, uh, a fellow real estate executive and developer, Josh Guberman. Right. Who's our so, partner. Who's your, is our, is but, our partner. And, so, and designer. You make this wine in Brooklyn? I don't make it, but I started the project. Okay. There are so two winemakers from Napa Valley who make it with grapes from New York. Besides the fact that Crush, how many, how many bottles do you make? In Red Hook, yeah. about 1,000 cases a year. A thousand cases, and where are they distributed? I mean, are, do, are they? Do you have them in your? Store? Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. I know you have them in your store. Yeah, they're in the I restaurant. I think we have it at Tribeca Grill. Yep. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure. And what about you, Bernie? We have local wines. We got quite quite a list of local wines. Right, actually. and that's but that's also become big. I mean, there. I mean, do you have a lot of Long Island wines? In no, no. We're we're uh, pretty much a traditional uh, wine store. Our selections were sort of francophiles or um you know very little domestic wine i mean we do have some of the at the high level uh we do have a lot of uh, uh cult cabernets and things but if you if you look at the, the the wine and spirits business i mean people never knew it people call it liquor stores okay they they, they changed the, the name to wine and wine spirits stores. and you know you know especially you know when you go to crush the, the way you display wine uh, is different than the other the other ways that wine was there. I mean, this is. A, I, I think people the promotion, the product, and everything. Well, it's respecting the wine. It's it's showing the label, keeping them on their side, and uh, you know, and also our electric bills because we like to keep the store quite cool, uh, even for the general population of the wine to res again to respect the wine. And then of course we have the cube, which is our rare wine room. I I asked this question prior to the show, and you know. You, I'm a Brooklyn boy, uh, Mark's a Brooklyn boy. When did wine become that popular? I, I heard you talk about it at Montrachet, but when do you think wine really saw this resurgence in New York City? Well, Bernie, I'd like to defer to yeah. Bernie because I think he hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it's when uh, in the early 90s, um, you can buy a bottle of wine from an auction. Uh, where the New York State legalized it. And uh, before then, you had to buy it from either a wine store or drink it at a restaurant. So the prices were very much set. But when the auction uh, houses became, were able to sell these wines, it became a commodity. So everybody got interested in it. Anybody that had a few dollars, hey, I want to get a bottle of 1990 Petrus. Well, I, I want it. And then the next person said, well, I want it too. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted it yeah it sort of uh, made a it opened up the market and made it like let the let the dust settle and let the prices settle where they uh you know where they should uh due to the popularity of the wine uh but also um the 1990 vintage both for burgundy and bordeaux uh were um you know a cornerstone vintage in both of them and they uh, there was a huge popularity, a huge surge in that vintage in 1993, and it coincided, inter interestingly, with uh, auctions being opened up uh, in the state of New York. And it, it's important to point out also that uh, people tend to, even to this day, to be intimidated by wine because it, it's such a vast, <laughs> it's an endless amount of wine that's produced worldwide. And everybody's trying to promote their wine. Yeah, but that, re that relates. How do you decide? You're a distributor. You're mm -hmm. distributing wine. How do you decide what you want to be di distributing? Well, I think we're in a transitional stage right now. I mean, I agree with what everyone's saying. But, you know, I, I think also part of what I'd like to add to that is I think that the uh, publications really helped. 
you know, Parker and the Wine Spectator and, you know, these wine But there was an article recently, Parker's out of business. Yeah. It's, well, well, that's well, a whole, well, I mean, we were talking the of the about <laughs> the, the moment of truth of when wine sort of, you know, became, uh, you know, a game yeah. and, and a hobby and an investment. Uh, but if you fast forward to the late 90s and into the early 2000s, the internet really opened up and became wine without borders. So now people in New York can shop in California, the advent of Wine Searcher. Uh, which is you, good and bad. Yeah, you know, which, it, but again, uh, like Bernie's point about auctions, it, uh, be, be, it opened up and became a competitive but, but, market. You know what? In, in a way, wine has become like Zagat's. You know, because everything they they look at the they look at the ratings, the ratings. Yes. You know, we said uh, well, too okay. I think we're transitioning out. So, of that. well, thank you because hope, yeah. when we opened Crush in two thousand five, uh, we made a choice not to sell wine based on ratings. So we don't. We may use tasting notes, but we never use point scores. We. We wanted to, um, and I have an amazing staff, and we're both very blessed with, with their palates and their determination to ferret out. We know his palate out. has nothing. You know? <laughs> what palate? <laughs> uh, but but so, so we never sell wine on points, and we have a huge email program, and we wanted to sell wine based on our opinion, and you can buy it or not, and it's been very successful. And now everyone, and there are other major stores in New York that, uh, and all over the country, all over the world, everything is, oh, 98 points. This, I, I but, know but, now, but now that whole foundation is starting to rear. Now, now, but the, I want to get back to, to Mark. How do you determine what you are going to be distributing? From a distribution standpoint, I go with what I like. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a terrible business model. But, you know, I, I wind up with clusters of wine. So some of the wines that you brought, what, what, price, what price range are they? You know, everything from 150 to 25 you know, uh, to down to $10 retail. But I think it's important that the wine needs to deliver vis-a-vis -vis its price point. And, you know, Bernie can attest to that. In a restaurant, you know, someone from the Midwest who wants to try Jean Georges wants to go in there. Maybe they don't want to spend $600 on a bottle. You know, Bernie's challenge is to find something at 25, 35, 45 on the list that can deliver. Fit that. It's, yeah. it's QPR, it's quality price ratio. If somebody goes to a restaurant today, what percentage is wine and spirits versus food? Well, I mean, the, uh, a, a restaurant uh, largely is about selling food. We are the ones that have marketed wine in restaurants. If, if you look back, 10 years even, uh, um, well, that's more than 10 years, let's just say at least 20 years, there were no sommelier slash wine directors slash uh, wine stewards in restaurants. Today, every single restaurant has a program. Why? Because it's a big financial dollar. So the, the mix is usually uh, 75, 25, 70, 30, food to beverage. Now keep in mind, wine is more expensive than spirits. So bars tended to be more profitable than restaurants that sell wine because our markups, first of all, our purchasing of wine and having to lay down wine, there's a considerable amount of space we have to devote and, sure. and, and we have to lay out money. Temperature, but, uh, inventory, all that. Uh, it's, you know, it's like, fortunately, it's not, a, it's not a perishable product by and large. Some can perish. And there's drinking. Unfortunately, he had some perishable. Yeah, no. hurricane. And, right. and that's like drinking, you know, young wine versus old wine. And, uh, you know, Ian McFadden, our fine and, and rare director, was just saying that, you know, finding restaurants with wine that's 10 years of age under $200, you know, is like a huge you, challenge you, you today. Know, it's, you know, what? I, I think something that when I was reading the bio of Mark, you know, you were saying that you grew up in Gerritsen Beach and, you know, you, your parents were, 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 were lower middle income people and, you know, but they enjoyed a bottle of wine. They, yeah. Today, I'd say more more younger people are are into wine. Would yeah. you say that, Bernie? I would agree. Okay. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, young people, too. The demographic yeah. right. the young, the, really the, got The young it. people, really, you know, uh, over there and, you know. But it, it, you know, it really did happen that restaurants. Yeah popularized wine because uh, uh, what we were able to do was talk to people who would accept our recommendations. And buy the glass programs, right. which and, became and even hot. though we have to mark up a lot, we still would try, especially in Montrachet, we kept the price down. And then a bottle of wine for two people or four people is a better value than what they're charging now for cocktails. Yeah. Now, Bobby brings up a good point. The wine by the glass, 
that also gives people the taste. And, and it became a, a big thing, like, you know, within the last 10 years. It, it really you know, was But it's very interesting. When I was reading about Bernie, you said that when you open up a bottle, you taste, your people taste every bottle. And I, I haven't seen that in many, very few restaurants, uh, that you taste it and, and that your reason is what? We wanted to make sure that when we serve a bottle of wine to our guests, that the wines are good. Um, not, not tainted. Not as tainted well as in terms of you know the quality that it should be what it's supposed to be, uh, whether it's corked or oxidized or whatever the reason, whatever fault it is. We want to make sure when somebody's spending good money for a bottle, we want to make sure that they're getting, you know, the A1 you know bottle that was they're supposed to have. And by the way, that is built in to a price, yep. and, and you know people go, oh, you know, why am I going to buy? spend money on it's a, part of the a, service a, a, but that's part of like the guarantee of you getting that that bottle is, and is and it, having it be appropriate we say is it the good housekeeping seal of approval yeah it, in it, a certain it, sense it, it, it's the because endorsement it, of saying that it because has we texture of, yeah because it's kind of like if we get a bad bottle we just quietly take the bottle to the back and pour it down the sink and bring a fresh bottle to the table, no questions asked. And that's part of the service that How we provide. And by the way, that's yeah. called the angel share. I just right. point that out. <laughs> well, what do you mean the angel share? It's the part that disappears. The part that the disappears to taste to make sure it's, 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 it's proper is called an angel share. And you know, just it's usually about half an hour. One more plug yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, now who, who are your customers? Uh, primarily great retail shops like Crush and, and, and restaurants. And restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to also add to, you know, Bernie's uh, comments, you know, this, this swinging pendulum, you know, what we talk about in the 80s of, of these restaurants introducing wine is, is huge. And that, that's kind of what laid the foundation. And there's been, a, there's been a bit of a rebellion the last couple of years in the market and also in, in the wine director uh, world where people don't, they don't take the time and energy to learn about what they're doing. So, you know, Bernie's a professional and ha take, has taken the time to learn about wines and his staff learns about wines. But it's important to kind of carry on that tradition. Like some of the new people that we run into, you know, they, they really try to abandon it. And they Bur feel like yeah, no Bernie is a you know, James Beard Award winner uh, in, the, in the wine business. How are, are young people wanting to become sommeliers? Are, are, they, are the people getting into this business? Pe today? I get resumes all the time from people who want to be get into the business. And they always ask me, how should I do this? How should I do that? And I've been very, very fortunate uh, in my career to be able to get to where I am. A lot of help from actually from this gentleman over here. Who has helped uh, quite a bit. If you ever of see talent. his family tree, it is scary. Have a good, well, it's like a who's who of, and by the way, also, I want to. I want to say that. Wait a second. Uh, and you know, normally you 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 talk about this when we're <laughs> resting him in the, you know, at the riverside. Well, you know, but yeah. uh, you know. come on, at <laughs> his age, here. how anyway. much time does he have? That's right. <laughs> uh, but but I want to. I just want to mention that as far as like wine directors and psalms, uh, we're in a golden age right now uh, 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 of of talent. And I don't think that it's ever been, it's, it's, it's certainly in New York, but I'm, I, I think of, you know, all over the country, I think that there's an incredible surge of young, like incredible talent, even some of the, the people that, that work the floor at Crush, um, and, and even some of the back office people, they're all incredibly, like, interest and, and want to, like, learn about everything. So he, uh, I, I think we're in a golden age of he, wine. He, Opportunity. He, yeah. Okay, but here's my question. New York State, you know, has been lobbying about, you know, allowing wine to be sold in supermarkets. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we were talking prior to the show, you know, and it's been numerous articles that Costco is the largest seller of wines in, in America mm -hmm. because of their, if, if wine gets into supermarkets, I'm not, I'm not here to discuss pros and cons, and I don't want to do that, will that change the business? I think it'll, it'll rebirth pr proprietors I, in I, one sense. I, what do you mean by that? Well, you go to, you know, Pathmark to get packaged bread. You go to a baker to get 
good that's, Italian bread. I, I, right. That was exactly where I was going with this. It's uh, if you don't but, care, but, if you don't care about wine, if you're just picking. If up, you want to pick up a regular, you can buy it. You could. Okay. I mean, people at Trader Joe's has it. I mean, no one. It, it's you know the old two buck Chuck thing. It, it, no one really cares. If you don't care, it doesn't really matter. But you see, but Costco is different. You, if you, I, when I visit my son in California, and I've gone into a Costco and I've seen some very expensive fine bottles of wine that they have. But you they're know, trying to drag people in, but they're driving down the profitability, which puts a customer. You, you know, right, because uh, they work on a much lower margin than you do. Yeah, they they do, um, but. Uh, you know, they're not going, I mean, for, for our purposes, I don't think it really you, matters. Not, you, As okay. a matter of fact, for our purposes, it might even, and I haven't really thought too much about it, but, you know, if that bill gets passed, then it's going to open up um, multiple licenses, which right, right now you don't. So, right. I mean, we'll open crushes all over the state right. of no, New no. York. And, and, I, think, and I, I think that's an important situation. Get your checkbook. Yeah, okay, but, but I think he, here... Works both here's ways. The, he, no, here's the yeah. here's the question. You know, when you go to Costco or if you go to Pathmark or if you go into a supermarket, there's nobody who's there who's going to give you any opinion of what but you want. Not, Somebody comes but in. No one's say, looking for an opinion at Costco. No. They just want to grow. Oh, this is two ninety nine. I'm taking it. It looks good. And that's what potentially it could do is create a bit of a difference. Yeah, I, I I think the intimidating factors of wine cannot be understated. I I'll go into Crush. And I'll look at our beautifully undulating wall of wine. And trust me, half of the wines, I don't know. I know the grape. I know the village. But I might not know the producer. Um, I've, I've been turned on by so many. I, I didn't know about Red Hook until I saw it at Crush, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of our uh, job. Gonna, you know, maybe we'll open up a Oh, I wouldn't mind that at all. Part of, uh, part of our job is educating. And the other thing is that wine is expensive and that there is a trust factor. When they go and they look at Bernie, one of Bernie's, the reason he was successful at Morache is because he, he's not pretentious about the wine. So he can explain the wine to the point where somebody says, I trust your opinion and we'll have it. The same goes in Crush. And by the way, Crush, it's interesting because when we opened the store, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. We now sell, I believe, uh, about the, the most champagne or the second most champagne. Well, yeah, we're, we're probably, you know, I mean, who, who knows because num numbers aren't public, but right. distributors tell me that we're in the top five stores but why do, in America. But, but we, no, but we gravitate to champagne sometimes because, again, that's something people know is prestigious, expensive, is a nice gift, no, and they know dump bearing but we're also super competitive on pricing. Here, here, I mean, here's my question. Costco isn't going to beat us okay, on Okay, which, uh, you know, uh, Drew brought in before uh, Barrymore. So this is a... Uh, That's Drew Barrymore. It's Drew Barrymore. So, but, but here is what I'm saying. You know, Coppola has, you know, certain people who've Francis been in... Francis Ford the, Coppola. Francis Ford Coppola has his wine. Drew Barrymore has. There, is it vanity wine or is it... Oh, I think some all. people are very passionate. Okay. I mean, maybe not all, but... But the people that I've met that are, that are celebrities are really passionate about it. It's a dangerous precedent to get into because you don't want your name to be associated necessarily unless you really believe in the right, project. Right, no, but I think uh, Francis, you know, his... Uh, and wine and he's made some mistakes. So, you know, right. I think he should have kept Inglenook in the beginning. And, and, you know, now he's kind of reinventing it and separating them again. But he, uh, went, at the very beginning... Uh, when the wine was a little bit rocky, the original Rubicon wines, mm -hmm. uh, when he took on the uh, rest of the estate, that's when they started making wines in huge yeah. Do you, do you, you know, see, double -edged -edged. Now, we yeah. were talking about, and there was an article about it, uh, you know, in Red Hook, uh, where we can go to Red Hook wineries, which is you, there are about four different places now where people can go in New York City for, like, city winery and other mm -hmm. places. Yeah. Uh, do you see this uh, growing? Because like Brooklyn Brewery and the uh, and the uh, you know the, the microbreweries for beer. Well, you, you got to separate breweries. Well, that's that's gonna... six days, and you got a vintage. Um, but <laughs> you know I six, mean, yeah, yeah, four <laughs> days. But you know wineries. I I don't really believe in the urban winery thing. We were doing the urban winery before it was the urban winery concept. I think it's really good to give access to people. That's the 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 reason I brought Red Hook Winery to Brooklyn is to get our local grape growing region a little bit more in the forefront of people in the It's a true city. labor of love for, for Mark. This isn't a money making thing. So. Sure. One of the biggest things I cannot figure out is I'll pick up a map about New York State wines and you tried to bring it up a little bit earlier. 
I have no idea. I mean, they, I know they sell their wines, but they're just never competitive the, the, in the, the world of wine. They sell an ocean of, of wine up in the Finger Lakes. It's right. amazing how yeah. much wine is produced. And a handful of them try to compete on a national level. Yeah. But right, but I think what, what Bobby was saying, you don't see that much Finger Lake wine. You see more of Long Island wine. Well, it's a regional it's thing. Regional I think most yeah, of it is sold up there. Upstate, downstate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. it's kind of like, you know, when you're in New East York, Coast, anything West above Westchester is considered upstate New York. No, I, when I opened yeah. Della Femina, East for instance, Coast, East West Hampton, I just wanted only New York State wines. Yeah. Um, and obviously, when I had my restaurant in Sonoma, I only had Sonoma wines. I didn't have Napa Valley wines. And I have French difficult. restaurants with only French wines. So it's it, it, you have to be able to promote in the arena that you think the customer is not going to be uh, too fooled by, you know, what you're trying to do. At Crush, we have no uh, from all over, yeah. but it's just got to pass but the muster. But my question is, how? It's very selected. Okay, the consumer. Mm -hmm. Where is the consumer today in the wine business? Very smart. Yeah, they the smart knowledge is getting price, more price accessible. sensitive. Yeah. Price sensitive, and I think it's a tale of two markets right now. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, uh, you know, it's not dissimilar from our society that you know there's a uh, a, a lower, you know, it's like lower class and upper class and the, the, the middle class is being nudged out. Um, I, I think it's that I, way. I won't I'm, see any of these in Applebee's. No. Right? I, I mean. I don't know. It's up to Mark. Definitely not. <laughs> um, but that being said, I, w I, I wouldn't be philosophically op opposed to that. I think but giving why, access. But I have a question. Mm -hmm. Why can't someone have a reasonably priced bottle of wine? You can. Okay. But you can't make great wines at huge quantity levels. So I'm, Applebee's... But, but, but what I'm saying is, I'm not talking, I'm talking about somebody who, you know, can somebody get a good $20 bottle? Absolutely. 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 Yeah. You can get there's, a great... There, there's probably bottle. 30 of them, or maybe 50 of them, at Crush right now. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. Right. Different grape varietals. Can, 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 can somebody get a... Fifty dollar bottle of wine, easily. Jean George, or easily. Uh, Drew's Rest. Yeah, we have at least seventy five wines under seventy five dollars. We got and it. It starts around thirty dollars. In a lot of ways, it's on, probably a lot yeah. more fun for you too. I'll tell you, we, I'll that's tell you right the, now. The, the and challenging. Whole, you see, and challenging. the thing for us is that everybody thinks you know, just because we have a you know big name, you know, we're you know we we think of us as being expensive. We're not. We're actually very value oriented. And this is one thing I've learned from or, through my career. It's people like value. You know, and I'd rather have a person drink a $30 bottle of wine, $40 bottle of wine at the restaurant than not drink anything at all. I want them to try things. This and is by the what way, we're there for. So next time when we do this. Call me, absolutely. Show, we're <laughs> we're going to have a wine tasting over here. And we're going to go. Why don't, we, why don't we do it at Jean George so we can oh, get yeah. some eats? No, no, we don't want to go to Jean George. <laughs> we, we have to go to Drew's restaurant. Okay. Let's <laughs> okay, well, we'll go to City Field. To I'll buy Jean George. Okay. You'll buy <laughs> <it. No. laughs> okay. I, I've really had a lot of fun, and it's been a true interesting show to talk about wine. And I'd like to thank. Uh, Needless to say, the executive producer for, for bringing his buddies and friends. But I'd like to thank Mark, Bobby, Bernie, Costru, and I'll see you, you next week.